best place to take in all the game day action every day. It's right here. The amazing, the incredible gallery, bar, book, and games at Ocean Casino Resort in Atlantic City for the absolute best time every time is right here at the Gallery Bar Book and Games. Hello and welcome in. My name is Mark Farzetta for the Jacob Media YouTube channel at 6abc.com along with Eagles Hall of Famer Seth Joyner and Eagles veteran reporter Derek Gunn. Very busy week and what should be a bounce back week for the Philadelphia Eagles ahead of them taking on at 8-1 the 4-5-1 Indianapolis Colts on the road in Indy. Very busy week for Howie Roseman as well, adding Linval Joseph and Ndamukong Sue to the middle of this Eagles defensive line. A lot of people worried about the run defense against the next running backs that they have to face, including today in Jonathan Taylor. First out of the gate, Gunnar, let me ask you this. Who can we expect, if either of those two players, to be in the lineup today? Well, first of all, kudos to Howie Roseman for identifying what we've been screaming about for the last five weeks, which is them giving up uh, yards uh, uh, on the running game uh, in chunks. So he went out and he got two of the best available out there. Now, you ask me who's going to play. From what I understand, both of them could be on the field today. Now, Linville more so because he's been here a few days longer, but Nick Sirianni gave uh, kudos to Ndamukong Sue for doing a crash course on the playbook and learning it. Basically, how much they play is going to be based on how they feel once they get on the football field. You know, especially a guy like Sue. Now, he's been out since last season. I don't care how much you practice on your own. It's still not like getting in that game shape. So he might play 10 plays. He might play 15. If he tells the coaches, hey, I feel pretty good, he might even get 25 or 30 plays in there. But Linville definitely, and Dominican Sue's based on how he feels by kickoff. All right, Seth, uh, you've moved around in your career, played for a couple of different teams. How difficult? Sue said that he can come in here and he can play football. you got to get in that football shape that Gunner alluded to. Right. But the terminology is what you got to get down. He said he's played in every scheme. He knows every scheme. But the terminology is the trickiest part. How tricky is it? Well, it's tricky, I think, for the guys that's, that's on the guys on the back end. You know, if you're communicating and you've got your hand in the ground, you got a guy next to you, you know, you're having those conversations before you put your hand on the ground. Now, for the guys, for linebackers and, and defensive backs, it's a whole different thing. I've been hearing this all week. Oh, he's got to get in shape. He had not played football all year. And, you know, nonsense, man. We brought this guy in here to plug holes. If he's got to run over 10 yards, we got a big problem, okay? <laughs> so I don't need him to be in shape. He needs to run five yards. I need like 10 to 15 plays out of him, and that's it. Mm -hmm. So both of those guys should be up today, and both of those guys should be able to play today, e e even more so Len Lenville Joseph because right. he can play nose. Not, not necessarily that he's been here that much longer, but you can put him at nose and you can cock him one way or the other. And now, you know, he might not be as effective as Jordan Davis, but at least he can keep guys off the linebackers. As far as Sue is concerned, and I was looking at some video of him last night, uh, of, of, of him playing last year, and I'm just blown away that this dude, you know, it took 10 weeks to get on somebody's roster because yeah. dude can still play. Mm -hmm. I mean, he, just, he can straight up play. And I, I'm just not a big proponent. Listen. I missed all the training camp one year. I came in the Wednesday before the first regular season game. It's the best season I had. The best season. Because so, so when, I mean, I was fresh, okay? My mind was clear. Um, you know, I knew what I was doing. So from the standpoint of him understanding, he said I played in every single system. Every single front there is to play. There's only a handful of fronts for you to learn and know. You know, so now it just comes down to communication. I expect for both both of these guys today to be a major part of what happens in, in stopping this run if they can get it stopped. Linville Joseph was in the building on Wednesday and Dominic and Sue got into Philadelphia eleven PM on Thursday night and was hitting the books pretty hard, as he told the media on Friday. Now, looking at this game, I know a lot of people are looking at Fletcher Cox and the fact that he played 70 snaps just last week so? on Monday night, 84% of the snaps defensively. And I'm with you, but here's what I know. I don't know what they have left in the tank in Linval Joseph. I don't know what Adamic and Sue has left in the tank. I assume it's enough to help the Eagles. But I also know this going into There's one thing I do know. It's going to be a better option than 84% with Fletcher Cox. And I don't want that to be an excuse but watching Fletcher Cox play as much as he did and not play at a level we have seen him play at in the past, this is only going to help the Seagulls defensive Can line. Can you see where we have evolved to? You know, I mean, understand where we've evolved to. We're talking about a guy that's being paid $14 million playing 70 plays. Okay? It's nonsensical. Get your ass in shape so you can play a full season. 
and play every game. Okay? Now, people be, oh, Seth is a dinosaur. They don't do it like that anymore. Listen, football is football. I never wanted to come off the field. Like, I couldn't play in this era. Because if you're going to send somebody in for me, I don't care if my tongue is hanging out. Uh-uh. I can rest when we get them off the field. I can rest while the offense is on the field. But, you know, if you're supposed to be the best player on a team and you're supposed to be the best player on a roster and you're the highest paid defensive player, get your ass in shape so you can play a whole game. I, I, this is nonsensical to me. It really is. I, and I, it bothers me. I saw several times in, in the game against Washington where Fletcher actually turned his back and the, and the blocker was dri driving him down the field even more so. I saw too many guys by halftime who had their hands on their knees or hands on their hips sucking wind uh, because they were getting moved off the ball. Today's football is about rotations. Everybody wants to have these rotations. The guys are making more money to play less. Now, figure you exactly. just think about that for a moment. Exactly my point. The guys in the trenches on the defensive side are making more money than ever before to play less. You know, if you play 50, 65% of the snaps, you put in a day's work as a defensive lineman in the National Football League now. So, basically, the Eagles identified playing Fletcher Cox 74 plays, 80% of the snaps, is not conducive to what we need right now, which is to stop the bleeding in the run game. And, oh, by the way, you're playing the defending rushing champion today on the road. Deep gun. Yeah. Okay. So, I can see by the time you get to play – Let's say 50, yeah, 60, yeah. 70. Sure. I can see you starting to like wear it down a little bit. Where the hell was he at the first 50 play? I don't know. Okay. I don't so now, know. So now that whole theory flies in the face of nonsensical because he didn't, he wasn't doing anything the first 10 plays. Okay. They were getting run through like water. So, and some of those plays that you're talking about yep. when he just stood up yep. and was getting driven down the field, yep. that happened in the first two series, you know? So the whole, that whole theory that he played so many games that he was just worn out and he had nothing left. He wasn't doing a damn thing in the beginning of the game. You know what? I, I wonder. Now, he'll never say this because of all the criticism he got last year. But if you remember last year when Fletcher Cox said he didn't like the scheme or how he was being utilized, I wonder if he's gotten to that point now. I wonder. Well, it's definitely worth asking that question, but also this. After that happened, I know it's a little bit different change, a little bit different uh, scheme from Jonathan Gannon. Wasn't overly aggressive by any me any means in that game against the Raiders, following that conversation that he and Fletcher Cox supposedly had. But it was a little bit more aggressive than what we had seen in the first maybe eight games of the season. So how much of the way this defense played is on the players themselves and possibly getting tired? None of us like it, but that looks to be what happened throughout this game. And how much of it is scheme? In other words, when you're going up against another running back that can certainly put up yards against you, like Jonathan Taylor in this instance, what do you have to do schematically with what you're going to have on that defensive line in order to make sure you don't keep your offense off the field and that uh, Jalen Hurts stays on the field for this game? Well, Jonathan Gannon says um, he doesn't have a scheme. He has a philosophy. Mm. Okay, So that's alarming within itself. Because every other defense coordinator I know have multiple schemes, and they can adjust their schemes to you know to what's going on during the game. Um, listen, the players ultimately have to execute, um, but you can't put your your two defensive tackles and your four man front in double team situations all the time. Like there's things that you can do on first down. Okay, so what's the blueprint now is. Come out and run the ball on the Eagles. Run it early, run it often. Because then what happens? If we can establish the run, when we go play action pass and we go bootlegs and we go everything else, all the misdirection stuff, we can, we can operate efficiently in the passing game off of it. Now, it slows down the pass rush. It slows down the flow of the linebackers. The safeties have to honor the fact that you're running the ball. Okay, so how do you combat that? If you're going to predictably run the ball on first and second down, there's nothing wrong with lining the guy up in a three technique, okay? The three technique is the defensive tackle lined up outside shade of the guard, okay? He's responsible for the B gap. That's the B gap that he's lined up in. There's no rule that says that he has to stay in that B gap all the time. On flow away, that, that linebacker on, on Fletcher's side in the three, he's responsible for the front side A to flow to the ball. So now... Why can't you just take Fletcher, take him across the face of the guard instead of in the B gap, let him take the A gap, and let the, let the linebacker just take a jab step to the B to cover it? 
See, now you screwed up their entire their, you screwed up their entire blocking scheme. Why aren't you running some kind of you know line stunts? You know, if you got all of this data, all these analytics that tell you what they run on first and second down and where they like to run it on first and second down and where they like to run the ball in certain field positions. Use that stuff to your advantage. Yeah, but so, when have you seen them run line stunts? How often do they run line stunts? They run it they, they run it every once in a while in the passing game. In the passing game, they'll but, yeah. but I'm but I'm yeah. just saying, I listen, D Gun, yeah. I get one hundred percent what you're saying. Yeah. I'm saying that when what you're doing is not working, exactly. then you have to come up with multiple ways, right. you know, to change what you're doing. Because if you let those guys listen, if Fletcher lines up in a three all day and he doesn't ever move, and the offensive line know that that's where he's going to be every play. He's going to get double team every single play. Yeah. So you have to do something different. You got to start moving people. You got to start walking these linebackers up into the line of scrimmage and then bailing bailing them out late. You got to walk them up and then and send them. You got to do something different. But if you just keep doing the same, what's the definition of insanity? Same, same thing, thing over and over. Yeah, and expect different but, results. Okay, yeah. but I'm gonna I'm gonna take it back to what Mark said a moment ago about whose whose fault is it more? Is it the players or Jonathan Gannon? We've been we've been shredding Jonathan Gannon mm -hmm. all season long, but the last couple of games in particular, I'm gonna put it on the players. It's because tackling is it comes down to this: a want to. I agree. You want how to tackle. I agree. And I'm looking at guys trying to bump guys, throwing chicken wings at guys. Guys not wrapping up when they're tackling, trying to hit bigger men up in the shoulders, and all they're doing is shaking them off. And then when they do get to a player, a player is carrying them another three to five yards down the field. That's a want to. A tackler has a want to get that man off his feet sooner rather than later. And this defensive uh, unit in terms of tackling has not come close to doing that the last several games. We D-Gun, I agree with you wholeheartedly. And that's why I said, when you asked the question, you know, the last question, I said the players ultimately have to execute what's called. Okay? But what is the – do you not understand what the, what the defense coordinator's job is? The defense coordinator has 11 chess pieces at his disposal. You know what makes great defensive coordinators great? is they understand how to utilize each and every one of those pieces. They understand each and every one of those pieces. They understand who the superstar is, and they know who the role guy is. And they put people in position to make plays, okay? That's what Jonathan Gannon has to learn how to do. You got a wealth of talent. You got all of these, you, you got two good cornerbacks, you know, that both have three interceptions right now. Why are you playing them guys off the ball? Even if you want to play quarters coverage, you can't line both line, both, both corners and the safety up at 10 yards pre-snap and tell the quarterback that you're in, you're in quarters coverage. Guess what he's going to do? It's third and five. Guess what he's going to do? He's going to raise up and throw the five-yard out route right. first down all day long. Get those guys up. Yes. And you can play quarters from bail. You can play quarters from press. You can play quarters from anywhere. You just got to have guys that are smart enough to do it, and I know those guys are smart enough, but he's putting them in a situation where they, they can't win. They can't win the way that he, he has them playing. And I'd say it all the time. I'll say it again today. Okay, what you see on the field is either being coached or it's being allowed. Mm -hmm. Or Hassan Reddick dropping back into coverage when he should be maybe going after the quarterback. That'd be another brilliant thing to do. Well, you, you, Quite you have, obvious you as have, well. You have primetime cornerbacks playing 7 to 10 yards off the ball consistently. It's crazy. You quick slant them all day, as Seth is talking about. That's the easiest way to beat a, a hard-pressing defense. If your running game is not working and your cornerbacks are not even going to come up in third-down situations, you're going to have them play 7 yards off the ball. Quick slant them all day mm -hmm. and make them come up. These are all things that we want to see defensively change with the Philadelphia Eagles. Offensively, they're going to go through a major change today, and there's not much they can do about it. We're going to tell you about that after we thank one of our newest sponsors in Salus University. At Salus University, our graduates are among the most highly trained in their profession because of our unique emphasis on research, interprofessional collaboration, and early clinical exposure. Learn more about our programs at salus.edu. Welcome back to the Jacob Media pregame show. Seth Joyner, Mark Farzetta, along with Derek Gunn. I can remember a game just a couple of years ago in Atlanta where the Eagles missed a couple of starters on offense right before game time with soft tissue injuries. One of those injuries was to Dallas Goddard. 
They lost that football game. And I remember afterwards speaking to Jason Kelsey and Jason Kelsey speaking at length about how much they missed Dallas Goddard, not just in the passing game, but in the run game as well. As a blocking tight end before known as a receiving tight end, Dallas Goddard, one of the best in the game to be able to do that. And Jason Kelsey said they had to throw out a large portion of their playbook when Dallas Goddard was not a go for that football game. Now he has developed into a very good pass-catching tight end as well, and the Eagles are going to be missing him for the foreseeable future right now with a shoulder injury suffered on that now infamous play that was not a face mask, unfortunately, but rather resulting in a fumble against the Washington Commanders. So today, gentlemen, the Eagles will attack this Colts defense, which is pretty good, by the way, without one of their best pass-catching weapons in Dallas Goddard and one of their best run-blocking tight ends in Dallas Goddard as well. Uh, Gunner, today, what are the Eagles going to do without Dallas Goddard? Uh, they're going to try to elevate the stand, uh, the play of Jack Stoll or, or Calcaterra. You're talking about Goddard, who has 43 catches compared to two guys combined that have five catches for 51 yards. That's not a knock against them. That's not what their job description was. You know, um, uh, the tight end Stoll has played in, in nine games, Calcaterra seven games, but their roles have been minimized because of the exceptional play of Dallas Goddard. Now, Nick Sirianni says they're going to have to find a way to implement them in the offensive game plan, especially the passing game. I could see them trying to go to them in a tight end screen, the way they use Goddard. But when you're talking about the overall product, you're talking about one guy um, in, in Stoll who's a really good blocker but hasn't had a lot of opportunities to catch the ball. You look at Calcaterra, great pass catcher, still needs a lot of work in the blocking game. So you have a sums of two parts trying to make up a guy who's arguably in the top three in, in the tight end position. To what degree are they going to utilize the tight end? And we don't even know the status of Tyree Jackson yet. You know, he's a big body, 6'7", you know, with a wingspan like a California condor. <laughs> you know, we don't, we don't know what his status is as of right now. Um, but it, it, you, don't make up, you don't make up the loss of a Dallas Goddard. The best thing for this Eagles team is this. They have so many other weapons they can go to at any given time that you, you will miss Goddard, but not as much as a team that was tight end heavy, you know, and, not, and their wide receivers is not as accomplished as the Eagles wide receivers are. Seth, what do you do today in a situation where you're missing one of your best weapons? You know, the, it's situations like this that really scares me because – you know, this could potentially be one of those times where, you know, like last week, they went to the game, they only ran the ball like four times in the whole first half. And basically, I, I think that premise was based upon we couldn't run it the first time we played it, okay? So we're not even going to come in and try to run. We're just going to come in and throw the ball. Fast forward, you know, to Dallas Goddard, you know, well, we're missing our – our best blocking tight end, we might not be able to run the ball. We might need to just line Calcaterra up out there and just throw the ball. See, that, that, that kind of mentality scares me. And it's not outside the realm of possibility that they would do something crazy like that. But it flies in the face of, you know, offensively in the first half, why they didn't really succeed a whole lot in the first half, in my opinion. Um, listen, I think a guy like Zach Pascal needs to have an expanded role, mm -hmm. um, you know, today. Um, I'd love to see them go from four wide receivers with, you know, the normal starters and Pascal in the lineup to force them into dime situations so that they can run the football and that they can spread the field out and create some mismatches. You know, maybe, you know, motion AJ, you know, uh, motion um, Zach Pascal to trips or Quez Watkins to trips and leave Devontae Smith or leave, you know, um, A.J. Brown at the X spot, you know, one-on-one -on, -one on one side where you can really make some hay. But, listen, if they go dime, you, you, you got four down and one linebacker and a DB in the box. You should be able to run the ball under those circumstances, and you should be able to create some things on the outside with that as well. Now, that doesn't mean you can't get into your regular. I mean, they, they love to live in 11 personnel, you know, one tight end, one back. That's primarily the formation that they love. You can still do it. The only problem is what begins to happen is if Calcaterra is in the game, you know they're going to throw the ball. They're going to put him in there to block because he can't block. If Stahl is in the game, you know, D Gun, he's caught a couple of passes, but nothing substantial. Right. You know, the mindset is more that, oh, he's in here to block. Yeah. So you kind of tip your hand as the offense coordinator when you're playing this guy is in the game against this guy is in the game, you know, 
if you don't plan on throwing the guy that that's the block of the ball, or you don't ask the guy that's the, the pass catcher to actually block. Uh, I'm curious because the Eagles are obviously facing a guy uh, in Jeff Saturday who is only coaching his second NFL game. Not a lot of experience, been well covered over the last couple of weeks, whether it's local or national media. This was supposed to be a nice reunion between Nick Sirianni and one of his mentors and Frank Reich, one of the guys that he calls one of the best coaches he's ever been around in the NFL. Now it's a much different story. Obviously, Jeff Saturday is going to get a lot of the headlines. They also face a very experienced defensive coordinator this week in Gus Bradley. So there's a lot to talk about just from a coaching standpoint. When it comes to this, though, and Gunnar, I'll start with you for this. When it comes to a guy like Jeff Saturday taking over that team, I thought it's a bit of a mascot move. This is a guy that the crowd likes. This is a guy that the owner likes for the Indianapolis Colts. This is a guy that he knows will get the locker room unified because it's going to be more than ever in that locker room an us-against-the-world mentality. Nobody thinks... Like when Nick Sirianni, we talked about this last week, right. when Nick Sirianni talked about Flowers, everyone jumped on him. When the Colts hired Jeff Saturday, everybody jumped on the Colts. That locker room, at least in last week's game against the Raiders, looked like it came together. They pulled out a great victory at the end of that game. What do you make of the Colts under Jeff Saturday as their head coach? Well, initially you're thinking it's a circus. Mm -hmm. You know, you, there were a lot of qualified candidates. You had two coordinators there that were qualified who were former head coaches as well that you could have implemented. But why Jim Irsay decided to go out and get Jeff Saturday, who knows? But I will say this. The one thing the Indianapolis offensive line had had problems with this year was blocking consistently. Saturday comes in there and identifies the problem. All of a sudden, they're a cohesive unit last week. Now, the Raiders stink, first of all. But their <laughs> offensive line, Black, is more of a cohesive unit. All of a sudden, your running back, Jonathan Tater, busts loose for 147 yards. Jeff Saturday said when he came in here, look, I'm here to delegate. I want you people to do what you do, and I'm going to step back. He worked closely with the offensive lines to help them rectify some of that problem, and boy, did it work out. Now, the good thing for the Colts is here's a team that everybody was left for dead. They go on the road in a hostile environment, and they beat a Raiders team. Now they're jacked up because they're coming home to face an even better team in front of a bigger audience. And all week long, I guarantee you, Saturday's telling these guys, if we can pull this off, and we're getting them on a short week, and they're nicked up coming in here. We're right there. We're still right there very much in the playoff picture. We're not that far behind Tennessee. Mm -hmm. All I'm asking you to do is go out and give that same maximum effort you gave against the Raiders, and let's see what happened with the results. Seth, what would have happened if uh, Bill Berge came into your locker room and all of a sudden was the head coach? It would be weird. <laughs> I mean, it, 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 it would be really weird and, you know, listen, Jim Harrisay owns a multi-billion dollar entity. He can do whatever the hell he wants to do with it, okay? But I also look at situations like this, and I wonder, you know, when they talk about Rooney rules and all that kind of stuff to try to level the playing field, mm -hmm. my question is, you know, an African-American coach's wildest dreams, could he, you know, could I have a dream of stepping off this set into a head coaching role or a defense coordinator role? Hell no. Hell no. I mean, that's just wrong. And you had got two guys on that staff that used to be head coaches in the NFL. Right. Now, like I said, Jamarison can do whatever he wants with that team. That's his. He owns it. Um, Jeff Saturday, I mean, are you really going to attribute last week's win to Jeff Saturday? You know, the, the one thing that he did that made sense to me was put Sam Ellinger back on the bench yep. and bring Matt Ryan back into the game. Matt Ryan went 21 for 28 for 221 yards and a, a passing touchdown and a rushing touchdown. Right. And then you turn around, you know, what What was the team lacking all along? Jonathan Taylor hasn't been healthy all year long. Mm -hmm. You finally get him healthy. He's got 20-something plus carries for 147 yards and a touchdown. Seems to me there was some balance on the offensive side of the ball that helped out the special teams, that helped out the defense, and they were able to, to pull out a win. So is it so much Jeff Saturday? Are we making too much of Jeff Saturday? It, it, it is not. It's not. You know, I mean, they made a, they made an adjustment at, at offensive coordinator. I think they fired the offensive coordinator, too. Yeah, they did. Okay? But the game plan, whoever that guy who took over at, 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 at offensive coordinator, he's not running anything. He didn't, he didn't install some new offense or something. You know, he just called the plays differently. And the players were inspired by the fact that, hey, JT is back. He's rumbling, stumbling, and bumbling, and Matt's out here play action, play actioning, and making plays. Okay, so maybe we're making a little too much of 
Jeff Saturday. But, you know, my main point is, you know, I, I think it, I thought it was absolutely insane. I thought it was ludicrous, you know, that Jim Irsay actually pulled him off the TV set and named him the head coach of that football team. Right. Well, you don't go anywhere because yeah. we're going to need you for the upcoming segments as well. <laughs> as much as I'd like you to take over the Eagles defense, not yet. At least not, let's wait to the end of the season at least. Uh, we will be going to Lucas Oil Stadium coming up in just a moment when we speak to our friend John McMullen from Indianapolis. More of the Jacob Media pregame show in a few.